Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spoiler Warning Podcast. This is review number 755 with a review of Poor Things. I'm Christopher Schnazy. And I'm Stephen Miller. And for joining us for the first time, the Spoiler Warning Podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week in the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest films coming to a theater near you. This week, we are talking about the latest film from Ergos Lanthimos. Uh, Stephen, you're a fan of his works, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I like Yorgos. I, I feel like we we talk about him more often than you would expect, and I think it's because I compare other movies to him a lot. There's a certain very dry style that he has that I feel like just seeps in. He's become an adjective like David Lynch or something, where it's like a shorthand for a whole vibe. Um, but yeah, I, I like him. I I think The Lobster was the first Yorgos movie I watched. And then I went back and watched Dogtooth and I'm sure others in the past. And since then, I've been keeping up with everything. And yeah, I always find something to like about it. I'm weird because my, I think my least favorite Yorgos Lanthimos movie was The Favorite, which was also most people's favorite Yorgos <laughs> Lanthimos movie. So there's something where like his mainstream appeal seems to be the opposite of what I get out of his work in a way that I'm trying to figure out. And that uh, may or may not um, be true with this episode, too. How, <laughs> I, I don't remember how you feel about it. I don't remember. How did you feel about The Lobster? So I so I definitely didn't see The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Mm -hmm. I feel... Oh, yeah, Carson and I reviewed that on our own. It was yeah, one of yeah. the few no Christopher episodes of the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I feel like I saw The Lobster. Mm-hmm. But I have a feeling it was one of those weird things where I may have watched it in a sketchy way during like a trying to catch everything that came out sort of situation. And it didn't vibe with me. I am curious to go back and check it out now. I am definitely not like I don't necessarily have that fondness for your ghost that, that you do. And I'm it's you know, it's not necessarily on purpose. It's just I haven't seeked out most of his stuff. I, I guess technically you might say that my favorite of his films was the favorite, but I think that's because mm -hmm. that's the only one that I remember. And even that one, I don't fully remember it. I just remember liking the performances, but I couldn't tell you a single thing that happened <laughs> except for I think uh, Emma Stone falls out of a carriage in the mud at some point in time. Like, like that's yep. all I can remember in my head. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, so I, I think coming into this film, I didn't have any expectations, right? It was just a thing where I was like, oh, I'm going to see this new movie. I, I, I assume Steven's excited for this just because of who made the film. Um, but I was kind of, I, I was just jumping in to see, I guess, I guess I'm more of a mainstream audience who would have gone in just having seen the trailer and I'm, I'm not carrying in anything previous into my screening this time. But I assume, yeah. as you said, that, that you're you're at least bouncing that that the difference between the normal mainstream audience and what you like of his films. Yeah, for sure. At the, maybe I haven't really figured it out yet. I just found I found the favorite to be the least memorable of his movies, even though I remember being pretty delightful to experience. But I just like like you, I, I can't really remember what it was about whereas if you see shit like dog tooth like you remember what that movie was about he uh <laughs> he goes a lot harder <laughs> okay in, in, in some of these movies um, but anyway he's an interesting filmmaker uh, and this one was getting major 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 buzz out of venice i was honestly sad and surprised it wasn't at toronto so we had to wait until now to catch it um but i was totally stoked going into this movie yeah i've definitely heard a little bit of praise um for it also i just stuttered in my head for a second because i have an ipad up with like the camera outside of the house and just there were two people standing in the street and they just disappeared <laughs> so, so wow. I, don't, I don't know what's happening um but uh yeah uh, i don't know what i was saying <laughs> I, I already made a joke in a work meeting today because you i looked up and you suddenly were not on the screen anymore and i made a joke that the rapture happened and it sounds like it's just like a staggered rapture keeps happening <laughs> Yeah, just slowly people are just flipping out of existence. <laughs> um, it's like a really, really weak henchman of uh, Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to, like, recreate the glove from all the little bits that got scattered around. <laughs> Anyways. I like it. <laughs> we're here to talk about poor things. Um, yeah, are you excited to get in this episode, Stephen? Oh, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and take a listen to the trailer for poor things and then come back and give everyone a review. 
This is Bella. Ba, ba. Bella, this is Mr. McCandles. Hello, Bella. No. Oh. She's an experiment. Good evening. Her brain and her body are not quite synchronized. But she is progressing at an accelerated pace. Tell me, where did she come from? I shall. For it is a happy tale. I am Bella Baxter, and there is a world to enjoy, circumnavigate. It is the goal of all to progress, grow. A woman plotting her course to freedom. How delightful. So that was the trailer for Poor Things. Um, basically, there's the story of a young woman named Bella Baxter um, who uh, has like a childlike uh, maybe aptitude and sense of wonder and uh, uh, and the adventures that she goes on as she uh, you know, learns about herself. <laughs> Stephen Miller, what did you think of Poor Things? Uh, well, first, I just want to comment that we are recording Poor Things and Godzilla Minus One tonight, which is a fun kind of mirror image of barbenheimer i think uh, because <laughs> poor things is very much the fucked up r-rated barbie story including like barbie having a central lead actress who is doing amazing work of gradually learning more about the world as the film progresses and so having to like change throughout the movie in a very continuous way um i I just want to start by saying that emma stone is amazing in this movie she's getting a ton of praise rightfully so it's weird to me that la la land i always forget that she won best actress for la la land which was a good movie and she's good in it but it isn't like the kind of role you remember this is the kind of role that i feel like she will be remembered for for a very long time um with that said i I admire this movie a lot. I love that it exists. I'm a big fan of it. I also found it kind of tedious, and I feel like it didn't always work for me. Um, Like, the stuff I admire about it, Yorgos Lanthimos, he totally commits to building a world of his own imagination. It's this kind of, like, fucked up steampunk Tim Burton sex world um, (laughs) that he has made. And it's just, like came out of his brain like it, i've never seen anything that looks like this movie it is very strange and unique and internally consistent in the way people behave and things look and it it is a very impressive thing to have created um and everyone is hilarious in the movie like emma stone is clearly the the mvp of this movie she holds the whole thing together and it's just like fearless and incredible in it um but Everyone else is great. Willem Dafoe is doing his Willem Dafoe thing, and I love him as this kind of, like, <laughs> Frankenstein's monster who is also Dr. Frankenstein type role that he's playing here. Yeah. Um, Mark Ruffalo, I've never seen him be anywhere near this funny in something before. He, he's kind of doing the Ben Affleck thing of he's being, like, so goofy and off the wall that you're not sure if he is in the right movie, but then he's so incredibly goofy you don't care. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, I really enjoyed his, like, rapscallion cad what, whatever you want to describe the character that he plays yeah. um and i won't spoil when it occurs uh but whenever you need someone to play an unredeemable prick they get on the phone they call christopher abbott and he makes it happen <laughs> and he makes it happen in, in this movie too i i like rami Youssef too though he he gets less screen time than i think i would have expected but anyway everyone in this movie is clearly committed to being in this zany yorgos lanthimos universe um and i think in many ways it's really cool it's like pushing buttons it's exploring sex and female sexuality a lot in a very um the the word isn't sacrilegious it's it's like it's irreverent it's like a very irreverent way to explore all these things and i love it but i'm have you heard of the term clapter it's when like a comedian (laughs) 
has a, a joke, usually like a political joke, where it isn't actually funny. Like people don't laugh, but they clap instead. And it's kind of a derogatory term comedians use for this like genre of comedy where you're right. the audience is meant to clap at you. Um, I need a word for that for like acknowledging cleverness and oh, you went there but not laughing because I didn't actually laugh a lot in this movie. Like the hmm. audience around me was laughing a lot. I was like, I respect you. I'm smiling at the fact that you went this far. I'm glad you exist. But it seems kind of went on and on. I felt like certain ideas kept getting dryly hammered again and again, like uh, maybe a client at one of Bella's establishments later in the movie might do. <laughs> um, it was just like, <laughs> It felt like a lot of dry repetition and wrote like things just there were times when I felt like I get the idea. I don't know that you are doing anything else with this idea other than just trying to squeeze it for every drop of weirdness. So the audience feels maximally uncomfortable. Uh, but there I, I felt like. I wanted a version of this movie that was like 30 minutes shorter than the one that I got. Um, <laughs> and there are also stylistic things that for all I know are required to make you feel like you're living in this wacky world of his, like the fisheye lens, like um, no sudden move. <laughs> this has like weird random changes to fisheye and other camera distortions. And I don't know why it is or what it's doing. And I found it very distracting um, and that's fine. Like, I'm glad people love it. I still liked it more than I didn't. Like, I gave it a positive review. I was happy I saw it. But I'm, I don't know. It, it just didn't overwhelmingly win me over on a visceral level the way that I was so hoping it would. And I think I'm going to wind up in the crazy minority of people this year who think that the better movie by a Greek director deconstructing a relationship and asserting a woman's right to demand pleasure is Fingernails with Jesse Buckley. Uh, <laughs> So that is my boom goes the dynamite. Christopher, this... how did you feel about poor things? <laughs> Speaking of films you never laughed at, I mean, that is a wildly different tone. Um, yeah. I, I guess subject matter wise, I could see I could see the the uh, bridge that you're building over there. But uh... <laughs> it, it's someone slowly realizing that they have a right to demand what they want rather than to conform with. Uh, anyway. I think there's a there there. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I, 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 I made it to the same destination as you. It's just like the tone, the tone mismatches what's what threw me off so much. Um, yeah, I do really, really love the Barbenheimer poll though. Like that, that, <laughs> that was a good. I, I like, I like comparing those two things. Um, I like that. I am going to do another t comparison myself. Um, which seems clear to me, and I don't know if I've he heard anybody talking about this, but this is basically a Swiss Army woman. Um, mm -hmm. Oh and, yeah. And I think, like, quite literally, and I won't go into sort of the backstory of where we get to Bella Baxter, but I feel like the comparisons run pretty deep uh, in, in this that story. Is, it's maybe makes me rethink the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's basically a Swiss Army woman if uh, it was told from Daniel Radcliffe's point of view as yep. Bella Baxter instead of from Paul Dano's point of view. Um, but, yes. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those comparisons in, in, in a second, I guess. Because, um, um, I mean, So Sorry Man was my favorite film of that year. Um, mm -hmm. Spoilers, this is not my favorite film of this year so far. <laughs> but uh, I did... I was excited <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> no, 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 but, but I mean, like, the comparisons are definitely there, and I like what it's doing. I think this is a film that I appreciate more than I genuinely like. You know, like, I've, mm -hmm. it seems like people are really, really loving this film. I, oh, I did I did chuckle repeatedly at this film. There were enough things to kind of like make me chuckle a little bit. My audience loved it, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think what you're saying is unfair. I, I did at times find the film starting to it's like, you know, it, in some ways it feels a little bit like a higher class family guy joke where it's like mm. they're trying to pull it out as long as they can so that it can continue to be funny. But I've grown tired of uh, of the baby that needs punching that. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this film. <laughs> um, but much but like overall, Family Guy. <laughs> yeah, but but overall, I really did enjoy this film. Um, as you talked about, the performances in this are are just absolutely stellar. Um, I, I think that you know Emma Stone is doing amazing work in this, and I guess I've, I've heard that it was not shot in sequence. But like watching mm -hmm. the film, I was like the evolution she is going on and how her character is. You know, whether you want to call it aging up or you want to ca call it like uh, just building a larger vocabulary, increasing yeah. in cognitive abilities, like 
doing that performance when shooting out of sequence seems like an insane task that I, I mean, I, yes, you have a script, so you know, these are the lines that are remembered, but it feels so, so organic and watching her progress from, you know, one state to another state and evolve and mature is just like, you know, like clapping the whole way. Like this is an amazing performance. And, yeah. you know, I just love all the work she's doing. It is kind of funny thinking of like, waiting to to award se season and then seeing like a a a demo reel of like carrie mulligan in maestro followed yeah. by emma stone spitting fruit out of her mouth and, like like crapping her pants i like i i hope to god that we get to see that and just like the combining those two performances in a way where you're like jesus christ what are we doing right now but like i i, yeah. I really think that emma stone was doing just amazing work and so is everybody else everybody in this is firing on all cylinders and i really really love the performances i really love like the the set design of whatever the hell this style is called like it reminds yeah. me a little bit of like you know wes anderson films you know it has that wes anderson color palette but wes anderson films are supposed to feel sort of like a set where like everything feels like you could just push it over and then it would just fall mm -hmm. because it's not really there. Like there's something that he's doing that's like really interesting. In this, it feels like all of it's real, but it's also made by like Dr. Seuss or like Tim Burton, yeah. as you said. Like it, fe like everything feels like it's really there, but it's also that's not what anything looks like. But it mm -hmm. just everywhere they go felt really kind of magical and like you know maybe it's supposed to represent bella's like view of the world and everything looks magical yeah. talking about when you're when you are who she is um and i really really appreciated that you know the the sort of metaphor of what's going on and like a woman coming into her own body how other people try to um use her or take advantage of her, her naiveness um you know that metaphor was like immediately available to you just in the way everything's set up and as it goes on it's almost where like she is racing to catch up with the people who are taking advantage of her which means the metaphor is getting smaller and smaller you know it, it's like a weird thing mm -hmm. where it's like you immediately get what it's trying to do and then the more you sit in it then you're trying to be like wait is it supposed to be saying something or is it supposed to be funny right now because i don't know which direction i'm supposed to be going or following it and i kind of over time it started to kind of um i was i i would vibe less not because i thought it was doing anything wrong but just because i was like okay we've been here i'm getting tired of this now what are you going to do next and and to the film's credit i actually really really like <laughs> um the way it starts to flip things on its head as chris rabbit mm -hmm. comes into to the story where it's like what it's doing then is now because you know at some point i was watching the film and i was like it seems like it has nothing left to say we got everything bella has gotten everything she's need i've gotten everything the film is going to tell me where are we going next? And that little sort of turn that happens where it kind of flips it on its head and introduces a new thing where it's like, what if fully yeah. adult Bella has to deal with a fully adult situation? Where right. does this bring us? How do we take that context back into the flashback of the original inciting incident of the story? Like, then it's like, oh, and then it's kind of like, I'm leaning forward again. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, tell me. Now, now you've got me, you've drawn me back in. Now you're doing something interesting again. And it kind of brought me back around by the end of it. But I think towards that middle two thirds of the way through i was kind mm. of starting not souring on it but i was just like yeah all right <laughs> good on yeah. your film and i think it really needed that kind of way it decided to and like you know in, in a way it feels like what i would complain about most films where it's like they ran out of ideas and suddenly decided to end it but in this film it feels a little bit like that ending was really where it wanted to get and it was just trying to milk that middle zone for as much as it yeah. could that when it got done doing that, it was like, okay, now I want to get to the thing that I actually wanted to do. Let me get there, finish off this film. And it was kind of like, it's a mix of the thing that I wouldn't normally like, but somehow that actually rescued me and brought me back into this film a little bit. So, mm. yeah, yeah I no, that, that, that makes sense. And I do, I think the ending is very clever. Like I, I never, like you, I never really soured on the movie. Like I was enjoying watching it a lot, but I, I just feel like there's a, there's a bloated middle part. And the, the Swiss Army Man comparison, I think is amazing. Um, and the thing is on paper, this has a lot of similarities, including her arc, because Swiss Army yeah. Man is all about learning not only about love but about life and about everything you know it's like teaching the swiss army man what it means to be a person and 
on paper, this movie does that for Bella. Like, I, I try not to get into spoilers, but in addition to just life and sex, there's a lot of sex um, in this movie. It is about learning philosophy and learning kind of social awareness and learning labor and political awareness and opening to different types of people. And then, and all of that then culminating in being about learning how to navigate adult relationships and potentially toxic adult relationships. Like it's all very interesting. The problem is I feel like as much as this film nods to all those other things, I feel like, most of those things she learns are throwaway. Like they're there in the background and you know that she's doing it. But the bulk of the joke of the movie is repeating over and over and over again, just to the coming of body, coming into awareness of your own pleasure and your own desires. And there, I, there's just something that feels a little lopsided about it to me, where it feels like it has so much more it can explore but it decides to shove that away. And I'm not sure it's totally fine if this is a movie that is trying to explicitly be about sex and sexuality, but I just feel like they're leaving other aspects of womanhood on the table. And I'm not, I'm not sure that it's better for that. Cause I kind of feel like we, we get the point after a while in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. And it, but at the same time, I kind of love the over the topness, like because the fact that it keeps going back to that well and making the audience squirm, like clearly it works. My audience was loving it and they were laughing louder and louder every time this stuff would come up. So like <laughs> there's a sense in which the movie is kind of beating you down and making you enter its wavelength. And that's totally fine. I just felt like I, quote, got it early and I was so excited for it to go in a million different directions. And then when it didn't, I felt a little let down by it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's like going for extending the premise rather than exploring the themes that it's bringing up a little bit. Mm. Yeah, if you think about it, um, that total arc is very similar to Barbie, including the kind of Christopher Abbott stuff and how all of a sudden it is flipping the world. I don't know. There's a fun comparison to be had beat yeah, yeah. for beat in these movies. But to its credit, Barbie remains being about the whole of being a woman and the contradictions of being a woman. And I feel like, I don't know, I, I don't want to be reductive, but this movie feels much more to me like a dude thinking, I want to make a feminist story. What do I think are the hard parts about being a woman? And it's like he started writing down a list and then at bullet point number two, he would just like, okay, we're just going to do that the whole time. <laughs> um, like, I, it feels like there's more <laughs> stuff to mine that he didn't, he didn't go for. <laughs> Yeah, he, was, he filled his page with all the things he could do with the first bullet point. <laughs> but he was like, you know, you know, guys, I think we got a whole movie here. We're good. Yeah. And I'm not squeamish. Like, I, lo I love that stuff. I, I thought it was all hilarious. It's just, um, it was like thinky. It was thinky funny. It was uh, the whole package is a fun prank, like a fun joke. But I, it, I wasn't like rolling on the floor laughing or anything. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it is definitely a thinky a thinky funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Somehow that somehow that statement best sums <laughs> up the experience of watching the film. Yeah. Um, and it it makes it the kind of thing where I would expect it to be critically adored and then audience scores to be low, but I feel like it's quite beloved by people who are watching it. Now, maybe it's still kind of limited release, so the only people who are watching it are people who would agree with critics on stuff but it seems to be getting broad appeal in a way that surprises me because I, I feel like he is pulling out all the stops to be dry and uncomfortable and disconcerting and quote weird um but i don't know it it's working on people it doesn't seem to be alienating them yeah i mean, I mean... It's true what you're saying. Like, th this expands wide this weekend, um, you know, a few mm -hmm. days after we're done recording this. Maybe right when this episode comes out. <laughs> um, so so it, it is hard to tell how general audiences are going to react to it. But I, But it does feel like it is weird enough and wacky enough that I can see the average person being like, this is fucking weird. This is kind of fun. You know, like, like it, it may yeah. not, it may not be like somebody walking around like this is going to be on my top 10, but like, I feel like the average person watching it 
Unless they're like in a really weird, like if they go see this with their parents or something, I, you know what I mean, like I could see, I could see like ever like, oh, we all love Emma Stone, let's go watch this together. Oh god, and, and then be like, oh, then I could see it, it actually being like uncomfortable and weird. But I think the the general weirdness of it, you know, sitting surrounded by strangers, I think is, uh, I, I, I think it's enough uh, fun to be had. Yeah, I guess, I guess it is overtly goofy in a way a lot of his movies aren't. Like, the world is funny and fantastical. It's not it, It's not funny in the way that um, some of his older movies are funny, where the humor is like a person spinning around blindfolded trying to decide which of his kids he has to shoot. <laughs> um, <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> this is more untethered from reality in a way that maybe is able to pull people in more easily. Yeah. Cool. Uh, should we, should we get the verdict, Stephen? Yeah, I think we should. I, I think there's no point in spoiling the movie. <laughs> Let's do it, Stephen. If you're going to give us a must see, record with a caveat, wait for rental, pass with a caveat, or a must avoid, what would you give it? I'm giving it a recommend with a caveat. I did have a lot of fun watching this movie and i'm really glad it exists like i love that yorgos lanthimos is out there making stuff like this and if this gets a ton of awards praise and a ton of love from audiences that's awesome like it, it's good for movie making that weird singular things that just totally commit to the bit are out there and emma stone is amazing like to me definitely going to be nominated for an academy award it, it's going to be a tough competition this year but i think she has an actual decent shot at winning the whole thing um and would deserve it like like yeah. she's amazing in this movie um my only caveat is i i love yorgos lanthimos's dry humor and i feel like this it feels less just aggressively trying to make you uncomfortable and more hitting the same joke a little too often and for me, at least, I found it kind of dragged. And I felt like the world he had built and the sandbox that he was playing in, I felt like it could have done more with the premise. So I was let down from probably the very high bar of best movie of the year type of hype that I heard going in. Um, <laughs> and if you have heard similar hype, you might also, like me, walk away feeling let down and think this is, you know, maybe like a lesser Yorgos Lanthimos movie. But still... Most people, you're probably going to have a blast, and it's going to be great, weird fun, and do not take your parents. Yeah, don't take your parents, or don't take your kids. I mean, <laughs> yep. you know, whoever, whoever listening, whatever age you are, don't take people that you are related to. <laughs> yeah, maybe start with Easy A, and that'll like ease them into the idea <laughs> of, you know, women's bodily autonomy. And then, if they're into that, that can be your, like, temperature check. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a record with a caveat for me as well. Um, I had a good time with it. Uh, I did chuckle more than Steven didn't. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had fun with it. That, that, that middle section or two thirds section sort of dragged me a little bit, but I think the film kind of brought it back in a really, really strong way and left me at least enjoying it. But now it's been like a week and a half to two weeks since I actually watched it. And it's kind of gone from my head for the most part except for just remembering how great the performances were and how beautiful that just every set looks and and you know everything like i i enjoyed so many individual pieces of the film and that's why i recommend it but i also the caveat is that like it hasn't really stuck with me and didn't feel like it was as deep as um something that you know i don't know like maybe it's was army man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for our review of Poor Things. Stephen Miller, if people want to find you that the week, where can they do that? Uh, people can find me at twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com. People can find me at christopherinreallife.com or at christopherirl at a number of different places, including mastodon.social. You can find the Spoiler Warning over at thespoilerwarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so on Overcast, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. Uh, if you want to know the episodes go live, you can follow us at twitter.com slash spoil the warning, facebook.com slash the spoil the warning, or instagram.com slash the spoil the warning. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can send an email to fans at the spoil the warning.com, or you can use the contact form on our site. Music for this episode will come from a track selected from artlist.io, so hopefully you're enjoying that. Um, we had fun talking about this film. We are about to go take off and record another review of Godzilla Minus One 
So see you in the feed uh, for that episode. Bye. Bye.